Open your Bibles this morning, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. We finished the Beatitudes last Sunday. And as we talked earlier, to be happy in Jesus, the Beatitudes are all blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. The word blessed means to be happy. And that's what our Lord has spelled out for us. And we've taken each Beatitude one at a time. And you, you may wonder, why take so much time on all of those Beatitudes? And it's because it sets up the entire Sermon on the Mount. That's the foundation to the Sermon on the Mount. And you'll even see this morning how as we work our way into this, the body of the sermon, if you would, that Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, we're going to go right back into the Beatitudes to see how it all fits together. We need to remember that the Sermon on the Mount is not just pieces and portions that can be separated out, but rather it is a complete sermon of our Lord, and that's important to remember. So with that in mind, I want to read not just verse 13 this morning, even though that is our primary text, I want to read from the beginning from verse 1 of chapter 5. And so we will read Matthew 5, verses 1 through 13. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, you are salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out, to be trampled underfoot by men. Father, we just ask this morning for your help once again. I thank you for your faithfulness. Each Sunday morning as your word goes forth, that you're doing a work, that it goes forth and, and never returns void. It accomplishes everything that you send it forth to do. And Father, I pray this morning that it would do that once again by your grace and by your goodness to us. Do your work in us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every pastor, every church, and truly every true Christian I know, we have a mindset that we want to impact the community in which we exist, in which we live, do we not? We want to impact the community in which we live. That's a good desire. Just, just know that. That is a very good and godly desire to want to impact where we live. But yet, sometimes that desire has led the church into some different and crazy, really, directions. And it has led oftentimes some of the modern American church into some very tragic things. In the 1950s, Robert Schuller wanted to plant a church in Orange County, California. And Robert Schuller wanted to make the biggest impact that he could. So what he did was he surveyed the community to find out what they would want in a church. And so he surveyed the community, and when he planted and opened his church, he made sure that his church fit with what the community wanted in a church. He made sure it had all the decor or not the decor that people didn't want. He made sure the service times were what the, what the community would want. And he designed his entire church to, to, to please the community around him because he wanted to make maximum impact. And by man's standards, his strategy was successful. Within a short period of time, he has thousands of members in his church, and it grows very quickly. Unfortunately, Schuller's desire led him into the heresy of universalism, which basically says that all people are going to heaven, whatever you believe, that God will accept you, that you don't need Jesus, that you just exist and God will take you to heaven because he's such a good and merciful and loving God because that's what the community wanted. 
message had to change eventually to appease the community. Schuler's desire to impact the community, though, and, and his supposed success caused others to take notice. And he began an institute where he trained other church leaders and pastors to do something similar. And one of his, uh, one, one who was mentored by him was a man by the name of Bill Hybels. And Bill Hybels wanted to plant a church in the Chicagoland area, and he did, called Willow Creek. Now, Bill Hybels, he surveyed the community much like Robert Schuler did, but he focused on not just what the community wanted, but what the community wanted who were unchurched. And, and to his credit, he wanted to reach people who weren't already in church. He didn't just want to build a church based on other church people and suck them out of other churches. So that, I give him some credit there. He wanted to reach the unchurched. He wanted to make an impact on the unchurched. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good desire, by the way. But he designed his church for all that the unchurched wanted. And he made sure that his church fit everything that people didn't go to church wanted within his church. And he became known as the granddaddy of the secret sensitive movement. And others, as they saw Bill Hybels grow a large church, Willow Creek there in Chicago, they wanted to follow his model. And see, so he opened his own little institute called the Global Leadership Summit to train others. And thousands and thousands and thousands of churches and pastors have followed that model and continue to do so today, that seeker sensitive model from Bill Hybels. Another who learned at the, at, at, from Robert Schuler was a man named Rick Warren. And you probably know Rick Warren more as an author than as a pastor, but he planted a church in Lake Forest, California called Saddleback Church. And as an author, he wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life, which had about, I think it sold 12 million copies, so very well-received book, and he followed that up with The Purpose Driven Church. And that was written, it's not as sold as many copies because it's mainly for church leaders and pastors, and he sold about a million copies of that, though. And in that book, Warren makes the case that for a church to continue to exist, it must continue to change with the culture. And he also made the case that if you want to truly be a church that exists for a long time, what you need to do is have a target audience and target those people. You need to figure out what kind of church you want to be and then design your church to fit with those people, with that people group. And I've even been encouraged by friends of mine that I, that's what I ought to do here at Norton Baptist Church. This, if you have ever attended a church and wondered I get this question all the time. Why are the ceilings all going black in churches? Or why are they getting darker? Or why is the music getting louder? That has to do with targeting a certain audience of people. And, and it's likely that if you're in a church and you're asking that question, it's because you're not in the target audience. In fact, most churches are targeting young families. Do we want young families here at North Baptist Church? Absolutely we do. I mean, why not, you know? Um, but that's, that's what most churches are doing. So it's funny they're targeting the same group. What I find ironic I remember hearing this from Phil Johnson once. You get a card in the mail that says, hey, we're a new church and we're not like any other church you've ever seen before. We're, we're innovative and new. And, and then you kind of examine where the church is at and you're like, you're just like the church, the five other churches that are just opened in the last 10 years here. You're, you're no different. Because they're all targeting the same people. They're all targeting the same group. The purpose-driven model, the seeker-sensitive model has permeated probably the vast majority of churches in America today. And again, I would reaffirm that we desire to impact our community too. Let's, let's, not, let's not pretend we don't want to impact the community. Uh, let's not get away from that. We are called to impact the community in which we live. But I believe that we are not just called to give the community a message. See, the, the popular phrasing today is, it doesn't matter about methodology as long as we keep the message clear. Unfortunately, what you'll see in most of these churches is, is when they change the methodology, it's not long until the message changes. That's very common. So I've seen churches go seeker sensitive and keep the message for a season, but it often, not every time, but it often will fade away and the message will get softened up too because when you're trying to please the community, as we said last week, when you meet the true Jesus, you'll either hate him or repent, right? You'll either hate him or repent, and so the true message will be offensive, and that's not going to be popular in your community. So the methodology and the message 
They say the message shouldn't change, the methodologies can always change, but I contend to you this morning that our Lord Jesus Christ, our head, is not only concerned about the message we give. I contend that even in this text this morning, we're going to see that he's concerned about the methodology as well. That he's concerned about the means by which the message goes forth. By the process with which we impact our community. Not just that we make up our own methods, but that we use his methods to impact the community and the world around us. And I would contend that Matthew 5.13 speaks that very clearly. Let's take a look at that verse together this morning. And he begins, Jesus begins the main body of this sermon by saying, you are the salt of the earth. Let's break that down. The first few words I think are so important. The first one is, is who is the you? Don't we need to know who you, who is you? And we could look back at verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you. So he switched to you in verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. I contend that the you in verse 13 is the same you in verses 11 and 12. And we didn't, I didn't make the case last week, but I told you that was the disciples. And by extension, that's Christians, that's believers. But let me demonstrate why I know that to be the case. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Jesus sees the crowds, and it does not say he goes to the crowds. It says he goes on the mountain, and there's a sense in which that's a retreat. It's moving away from the crowds. Now, we know from later on in Matthew that the crowds did follow him up there to some degree. But notice that when he sits down, who is the focus? His disciples. His disciples come to him. And he teaches his disciples. So when Jesus changes the pronoun to be you, he's talking to his disciples. So by extension, we can say that he is talking today to you who are in Christ this morning. If you are in Christ, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. There aren't two tiers of salvation. There's not a tier where someone comes into some form of belief but isn't a follower of Jesus and then takes another step to be sanctified. No, the same grace that saved you is the same grace that changes you. If you haven't received changing grace, then you haven't received saving grace because it's not two separate graces. It's the same grace. When God makes someone into a new creation, guess what? They become a new creation. And so these are disciples, these are Christians. These are Christ followers. And if you are in Christ this morning, this is you. And we can think of it individually, and I believe that's a correct application. But the you here, it does not come through in the English when you is plural or you is singular, but the you here is plural. If we were in the South, we'd say y'all are the salt of the earth, right? You, you guys, if we were in New Jersey, are the, are the salt of the earth. We would be able to express that plural a little better. But here in Ohio, we'd just say you, and you'd have to know it's you. But it's a plural. So therefore, it applies to the church. It applies to the church. It applies to Norton Baptist Church, but it applies to the church Everywhere, wherever it gathers around the whole world. The salt is sprinkled all over the earth in Christians and in churches that exist who are made up of believers. And the church, remember, is just an assembly of people made up of believers. And we have the universal church in that sense, and when we have the local body church. And we have both of those. So you, Christian, church are the salt of the earth. This is a declarative statement. That R makes it a declarative statement. At present, right now, you are the salt of the earth. Let me, let me demonstrate why that's important. Because Jesus did not say, you should be the salt of the earth. It's not what he says. He doesn't say you should be. He doesn't say you could be. He doesn't say you can be. He does not say, I hope you become the salt of the earth. 
He does not say, I need you to be the salt of the earth. That's not what he says. He does not say, if this, then you will be the salt of the earth. He does not say, if you are the salt of the earth, then that. No, he says, you are the salt of the earth. The church of Jesus Christ is the salt of the earth. Christian, you are the salt of the earth. Just as God has made you into a new creation, he has made you into salt. You are salt. Jesus Christ declares that to his disciples. He declares it to you today that you are the salt of the earth. It's important to look at the word the. You say, are we going to take this whole verse one word at a time? Just the first few words because it distinguishes something in this declarative statement. You are the salt of the earth. That's a singular salt. And the word, the definite article the is in the original Greek. Remember John 14, 6? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. That's exclusive. He's the only way, we could say, because the definite article is there. He's the only truth. He's the only life. Church, you are the only salt. You're the only salt. Christian, you are the only salt on the earth. There is no other salt. God doesn't have a storehouse of salt someplace else. No, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus Christ declares the church, declares Christians to be the salt of the earth and the only salt of the earth. This is God's desire for us. This is God's design for us that we are the salt of the earth. So what's it mean to be salt? I mean, that's, that's an important question. What's it mean? What does Jesus mean? That's a better question. What does Jesus mean to be salt? Because salt gets used for a lot of things, doesn't it? Here in Ohio, we use salt to melt ice, don't we? Put it on the sidewalk, melt the ice, make it safer. Is that what Jesus means? No. We also use salt as a preservative, don't we? And, and I've heard this text used as that, but that's not. If we look at the text more closely, we're going to find out, actually, that's not the case. Um, how, what else do we use salt for? I use salt in my barbecue. And, and I use it to make the meat more moist, and that's okay. But here, Jesus is talking about flavoring. He's talking about taste. We use salt to season food for taste. Look at, it, look, at, look at what he says. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless or unsavory, if it has no saltiness. So while salt can be used for all of things, he is talking about flavoring of food. A number of years ago, uh, my wife and I wanted to go, to a, go get a steak I don't know, some special occasion. might have been an anniversary, but we were going to get a steak. And we, there's a steakhouse in Wisconsin Rapids where we used to live that, that I had been to one time, but we had never been to together. And I'm like, let's go out to the branding iron. And I always read the reviews before I go anywhere. And the reviews were pretty good. But one of the things that it said on there is um, they don't put any seasoning on their steaks. Now, what I thought that meant was they don't put pepper on them. They don't put garlic powder on them. They don't put you know, any steak seasoning on them. But I didn't think they meant they don't put any salt on them because it's a steakhouse and you put salt on a steak before you grill it, by the way. I just, if you don't grill, if you, if you don't put salt on your steaks before you grill them, you got to change. I mean, repent. <laughs> it makes all the difference in the world. So I ordered my steak and I took a slice of it and I tasted it and I knew right away they don't salt them either I, I thought no seasoning meant these other things I didn't know they didn't mean no salt and, and I salted it but let me tell you there's a big difference between salting afterwards than salting before when it comes to a steak and now that your mouth is watering we're probably not done talking about food today but salt has an impact doesn't it salt I knew right away they didn't salt these steaks. I wouldn't have had to read the reviews to know that because all I did was have to taste it and go, there's no salt on this. Have you ever had soup that's low salt or no salt? Some of you, some of you might be on a low salt diet. I pity you. I'm sorry. It's sorrowful. <laughs> because 
Salt makes so much difference, doesn't it? If I gave you two soups and one was salted correctly and the other was unsalted, you would immediately know the difference, wouldn't you? Because salt has an impact. And just as salt has an impact, Christians, the church, has an impact on the community. We are the salt of the earth. We have an impact on our community as the church, as followers of Jesus, as Christians. One th- other thing I want us to note about salt, salt is different from what it seasons. You wouldn't shave carrots and grind carrots down and then season your carrots with carrots. Would you? I mean, that'd be silly. But salt impacts your carrots because it's different from carrots. In fact, I, I, so, so the Christian is different from what it seasons, correct? The Christian is different from the world. In fact, isn't that what the Beatitudes have been showing us? Every Sunday I've talked to you about the world wouldn't, wouldn't think this is blessing. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. The world looks at that and says, no, that's not the way of blessing at all. It's totally upside down. Jesus has flipped the entire world upside down by his teaching. It's contrary to everything in our natural nature, isn't it? We're different. We're different from the world. Salt is different from what it seasons, but I would, I would say this, that the very reason salt has an impact is because it's different. The very reason a salt has an impact is because at its very nature, it's chemically different from what it impacts. Salt also impacts not by doing something, by just existing and touching it, doesn't it? Salt doesn't set out and say, I'm going to go have an impact on that food. It just gets sprinkled on the food and it has an impact, doesn't it? We can parallel this with a Christian. We have impact just by existing here. If we live out as Christians, we have impact... Just by being here, we have impact because we're different from the world around us. And Jesus goes on and he says, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and be trampled underfoot by men. You know, if I sit at my table and I was served something that wasn't, my wife is very good at seasoning stuff, so I very rarely grab the salt shaker at our house. But if I do have to, and I were to pour some salt on my vegetables, and I would taste them, and there was no difference, probably the first thing I'd do is try again. You know, and then if there was still no difference, I might check, are the holes plugged on this salt shaker? And I'd have to get my glasses out because I can't see. And I would find out if the salt is actually coming out, you know. And then I might put a whole bunch on. And if it still doesn't do anything, I probably would take that salt in my hand and taste it. And if it didn't have taste, I might check with my wife, have I lost my taste buds? You know? (laughs) And I would have her check it. And if it was tasteless, it'd it'd get dumped out. Like like Jesus said, I I don't know if I'd throw it in the road necessarily, but I'd throw it in the garbage. It'd be useless to me. It would be completely pointless to keep it around. In fact, I would go to the box from whence it came and I would test that. You know, is, is this salty? <laughs> and if it all was tasteless, I would dump it and I'd go get something different. In fact, Jesus says, how would you make it salty again? I mean, what would you do? Would you, would you find some new salt and mix it together and hope that maybe it resalts the salt? You wouldn't do that. It'd just dilute the salt that you have. You'd keep the good salt and you'd throw out the bad salt. Now, something very interesting is is salt is extremely stable. Salt doesn't lose its flavor. Salt doesn't become tasteless. That's not what salt does. I mean, how long do you think it sits in the ground before we mine it out? You know, Rittman, I think, has salt mines, right? I mean, right nearby here. That, That salt sits in there for a very long time before we go down, take it out, and put it into the store in a box or in a can. I've got some salt in um, our cupboard 
I don't know why. I, I mean, it's only a few dollars to buy a box of salt, but I brought it with us when we moved. You know, I should have probably dumped it out, you know. <laughs> and it's, it's Morton's canning and pickling salt. Um, and I've probably had it for seven years. And when I go to the box, it is now a rock, okay? But I can still use it in brines, so I can still pound on it a little while and get some chunks off till I get the amount I want, put it in water, and make a brine with it. So it's still good to me, so I'm not throwing it out. I'm a cheapskate, just, what it, just the way it is. <laughs> but this salt is rock hard, and you think, well, it's changed. No, it's just hard because of the moisture in the air, and it's tracked that moisture. It doesn't have anti-caking agents in it, so it's caked up. But it's just as salty as the day I bought it, seven years later. And you could keep salt in your pantry for years and years and generations, and it'd still be salty. So why would Jesus say, if the salt has become tasteless, if salt can't lose its taste? And it can't. By the way, that's good news. If you're a Christian, you remain in your Christianness. <laughs> you, you remain salty. That's what Christians do. We remain salty. That's good news for us as Christians because we can't lose our salt. I'm so thankful for the truth that I, I, if I could lose my saltiness, it'd be gone. If it was all dependent on me remaining salty, I'm so thankful that I've been made salt and God sustains me and keeps me salty. Keeps me with taste. So why would he use this? It's really a hypothetical situation, isn't it? Almost like if the salt could become tasteless, you'd throw it out. And I think what Jesus, I, I'm confident what Jesus is saying here is this. That your very difference, your saltiness, your difference from the world is what gives you value to make an impact in this world. Your very difference, the fact that you are a new creation is what makes you valuable to have an impact on the world around you to have an impact on your community. And if you weren't different, if you weren't salty, you'd be worthless. So why not get very comfortable in the fact that you're different, in the fact that you're a new creation, in the fact that you've been made holy and blameless before God and you're being transformed and sanctified day by day. Why not get very comfortable with that? Because that, if you want to make an impact, church, live out what you've been made to be in the world around you. Live out your saltiness. We must become comfortable with our differences. I remember our neighborhood They've had some fires on the circle that we live on. We live on a cul-de-sac there, and they'll set up a campfire kind of on the, on the, on the, in the road. We just take over the road, and people have to go around us, and they do come around. But you, we're just in the neighborhood where we all exist, so it's our neighborhood. But they have invited our family to go, and, and we've gone out there a few times, and I try to make a showing every time they have one just because I want to have an opportunity to be, have an impact, right? I want to have an impact. But can I tell you, as I have sat there, and I think my family would have testified to the same thing. It doesn't take long for me to recognize, I don't fit in with these people. <laughs> and they start talking about things that they love and things that they experience, and I'm like, I wouldn't want to experience that. I don't know why you'd love that. I don't say that. I just know, man, I'm different. And then they start asking me questions, and, and I'm sure as I answer their questions, they go, man, he's different. And I'll tell you, I don't fit in. I don't fit in with my neighborhood. And I, I can't can confess to you, that can make me uncomfortable. Have you been there? I like to fit in. I like to be popular. I like to be liked. Don't you? But the reality is, is I think what Christ is telling me here and telling us is, hey, you're going to be different. Get comfortable with that because that's what's making an impact on your neighbors. That's what's making an impact in your workplace is the fact that you're not like them. The fact that you're not like them. And I firmly believe that Jesus here in this verse absolutely destroys any concept of the seeker-sensitive church, of the purpose-driven church, 
He says, no, don't appease them. Don't seek to be what they want you to be. Don't seek to be liked by them. No, 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 no. Be different than them. Be holy, be blameless. I'm not saying be different, just try to be odd. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes Christians can do that and they just are odd. Uh, No, he's talking about living holy, living blamelessly, and, and I'll make the case in a moment by living joyously, even in suffering and difficulty. That's what he's calling us to. The Purpose Driven Church models say modify who you are so you'll be palatable to your target audience. But Christ, the head of our church, says you want to have an impact on the world then be different than the world. Don't be like the world. Be what I've called you to be. Live out who I've made you to be. I've made you a new creation. I've made you a new creation. Live like that. Live it out. That's the way to have impact on the world around us. And if you use the world to attract the world, you will only win the world to the world. If you use the world to attract the world, you're only going to win the world to the world. You've not won them to Christ. But if you live as Christ in the world, you're going to have an impact. If you live as Christ in the world, you're going to have an impact. You'll have an impact on the unbeliever because they're probably going to hate you, be confused by you, ostracize you, persecute you, just as he said in the previous two verses. And if you live as Christ, and there's an there's a unbeliever who's being drawn by Christ, you know what? They'll be attracted to that. The unbeliever who's being drawn by the Holy Spirit is going to be attracted to that and say, tell me more. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what makes you so different. And they're going to want that difference. And that's the methodology our God uses in Christians to impact the community and the world we live in. And that's what Jesus is saying here. But a question you probably have is how do we live as salt? How do we live as salt? How do we carry this out? This is, what, this is who God made us to be. How do we live it out? And I would be a failure as a preacher if I did not try to flesh that out a little bit for you this morning. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter writes to the suffering Jewish Christians. These Christians have been scattered. There were Jewish people living in Jerusalem, and they've been persecuted, and they've been chased out of Jerusalem into the Gentile regions, trying to flee from that persecution of the Sanhedrin and other religious leaders. So they lived under threat of persecution. Not only that, now they're in Gentile areas, and the Gentiles and the Jews didn't get along. They hated each other. And so now they're living in a region where their neighbors don't like them because you're a Jew, and we're Gentiles, and we don't mix. So we have nothing to do with each other. And those poor Jewish people, they couldn't join the synagogue because the synagogue wouldn't take in Christians because they had a different faith, the Judaizers, so to speak. And so they, weren't, they didn't have a synagogue in their community, in the Gentile community. These people are true exiles. All they've got is their own brothers and sisters in Christ in the communities that they live in. That's all they have. They know suffering. They know persecution, these people who Peter writes, Peter writes to. And look what he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their fear and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and fear, having a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. If you suffer for the sake of righteousness, have we heard that recently? Spent all last Sunday on that. Suffering for the sake of righteousness. Suffering for the sake of Christ, who is the only righteousness we have. And if you do that, Peter says you're blessed. Where did he learn that from? (laughs) 
Right from the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> yeah, from Jesus. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, he learned it from Jesus. He learned it at his feet on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil about you. Rejoice and be glad. Isn't that what Jesus told them? And what's the response to this suffering? He says, you're blessed. In verse 15, how do we prepare for that suffering? How, do we, how are we ready to endure it? It says, verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And everybody likes to skip to giving an account for the hope, but we need to stop there. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. I, I say this a lot. We don't understand what the word Lord means. We say Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't stop and say, wait a minute, what's it mean that he's my Lord? But Lord means master. A Lord, a kurios, has a doulos, a slave. A Lord has a slave. That says, so Christ is your master. You are his slave. And it says, set him apart. Sanctify him in your heart as Lord. Set him apart as the only one that matters to you. As the only one you'll listen to. How do we do that? I think I've preached on this before. Be filled with the Spirit. When Jesus prayed, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I know I say those probably every other sermon. I use those for you. But it's the truth. It's the word of God that is the sanctifying agent that helps us to sanctify Christ, to set him apart so that he is the Lord. If he is Lord, we will pay attention to his word. We will love his word. We will love to know him through the word and know everything that he calls us to be. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Not just an exterior thing, a transformation in your life. What God has done to make you a new creation Live it out. Love it. Enjoy it. Be thankful for it. Study. No. Learn doctrine. Learn theology. Because that's learning who Christ is. And how can you set Christ apart as Lord if you don't even know who he is? We've got to know him. That's the joy Paul says. To know him in his, in his resurrection and his sufferings. To identify with him. And then he says, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Not for your innocence, not a defense of, you know, I wasn't there, I didn't do it. No, to give a defense for the hope that lies within you. What's that indicate? That you have expressed hope to others. Because why are they asking? Why are they accusing you of having hope? Because somehow your life has demonstrated that you have hope in the suffering. I believe this is very parallel to where we're at in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at the Beatitudes again. Each one begins with the word blessed, which means to be happy, to be joyful, to have full contentment, blessed. And each one is a flipping upside down of what the world would say. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the mourning. Blessed are the lowly, the hungering and thirsting for righteousness. No, 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 no. Blessed are the merciful? No. Blessed are the ones who receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart? No. Blessed are the ones who get away with it. Blessed are the peacemakers? No. Blessed are those who come to you. Blessed are those who, when people come to you and, and want to make right with you, but you stand firm in whatever you believe and think. Blessed are the persecuted? Come on. And those first phrases, I would agree with you. I don't like them more. I hate, I, I tell you, the older I get, the more I cry. And I hate crying. <laughs> Every time I cry, I want to stop crying. <laughs> I don't feel blessed because I'm crying, but the blessing isn't found in the first section. That's the path to the blessing. And I want you to look at the blessing. 
Let's look at these blessings this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word is there is a present verb. If you are in Christ this morning, the kingdom of heaven is yours today. Right now. It belongs to you. Or better, maybe, you belong to the kingdom of heaven. You're in. <laughs> if you're in Christ, you're in the kingdom already. That's beautiful. I love that present reality that I have, that I am in the kingdom of heaven. But then look at the next six. For they shall be comforted. For they shall inherit the earth. For they shall be satisfied. For they shall receive mercy. For they shall see God. For they shall be called the sons of God. Those verbs there are all future. It's all future. You mourn today, church? Sure. But you have a future comfort coming. You have a future comfort coming. You're lowly on the earth today. You're a nothing. You're a nobody. Especially in the eyes of the world. Great. Because you're going to inherit the earth. Oh, you didn't inherit it yet. But you got a future. You got a hope that won't disappoint. You shall inherit the earth. It's coming. You hunger and thirst for righteousness? That's all right. You're going to hunger and thirst your whole life because you're not going to attain it here. You're not going to live righteously, are you? Not perfectly. But you shall be satisfied one day. Satisfaction is on its way. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And I've received mercy today, but I've got a mercy coming at that judgment seat where I am found righteous before God. Faultless to stand before the throne. Isn't that what we sang this morning? Faultless. Can you imagine that? Faultless before the throne of God? Me? Not a chance. Oh yes, by the righteousness of Christ, I will be faultless before that throne. And I'm not there yet, but I shall stand there one day. The pure in heart, they shall see God. I'm going to see him one day face to face. What a hope that is. Peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. I will be called a son of God, and if you are a woman, then a daughter of God, if you're in Christ today, you will be called that into eternity. Don't you see the hope that you have? That's not realized yet. Hope is not hope. Paul says in Romans 8, Hope that has been realized is not hope. It's yet to come. And these six Beatitudes give us a future hope. And then we see the last Beatitude. Jesus bookmarks it with the present. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see that? He bookmarks present kingdom of heaven, present kingdom of heaven, and everything in between is future. Why are you happy today? Because your present reality gives you a sure and future hope. That's why you're happy. That's why you're rejoicing today. That's why you're glad. Because your present reality indicates your future hope. And it's sure. And it will not disappoint at all. Ours is the kingdom of heaven. And it all gives us that hope. And the call of our God is to live out those blessings and live as a blessed one. When the world sees you suffering, when the world sees you mourning, when the world sees you heartbroken over the fact that there's a lack of peace here on earth, and all of you have experienced that to some level or another, the lack of righteousness here on earth, and all of you have experienced that suffering and yet there's still a smile on your face and a song in your heart. And they look at you and say, what is wrong with you? When someone passes away, I, I, I'll share again, my friend Simon that passed away here just a couple of weeks ago and I talked to his wife and you know, he was taken suddenly, 53 years old, just gone, no health problems. We didn't know of any anyway, and he wakes up one morning and is gone within an hour. 
And Louise, his wife, has him taken away suddenly. And my wife and I sit with Louise, and she's smiling just a few days later because she knows where Simon is and because she knows her hope, because she knows she's in the kingdom, and she knows Simon was in the kingdom and is in the kingdom. He's realized all of these blessings, all these future blessings, and she's still awaiting them for herself. Now, how can she smile, the world would say, How can she be happy? How can she ever crack a smile the rest of her life? She lost the love of her life. And the world would scratch their head and say, I don't know what this is. And some would hate her for it. Some would say she's bitter, that that she didn't love him. That's why she's happy. He's gone. Some would say that. The world would make all these accusations about her because they got to explain it away somehow. But to those who are being drawn by Christ... They're going to ask, Louise, what's up with this? Tell me how you can have joy. I lost my spouse years ago, and I still can't get over it. And she would say, oh, I'm not over it. (laughs) So many of you have lost your spouse. You're still not over it. You won't be in this life. One second into heaven, you'll be over it. But until then, you're going to mourn the loss of your loved one. It's the way it is. But you have joy today as you await your hope, don't you? You say, sometimes, sometimes, (laughs) the call to be salt is to have that joy in our holiness and our blamelessness as we follow after Christ and our sanctification. It's not just to live a righteous life, although that will get their attention, but it's the joy that we have, the blessing that we have. Christians ought to be the most joyful people on the planet. We ought to never let the world outperform our joy because we have true joy. Theirs is fleeting, it's fading. Ours is permanent and sure. It's a sure foundation, isn't it? Church, Norton Baptist Church, we want to make an impact on our community here in Norton. We need to live out the joy that we have as we sanctify Christ in our hearts. Come what may. Because we know what's coming. You're the salt of the earth. Let's pray. What a blessing it is, Father. What a gift it is to be your salt here on the earth. And I, I recognize one thing. We can't even do this without your grace. <laughs> we wouldn't have hope without your grace. And so we thank you this morning. We adore you. We praise you for the grace you have given us. Father, I I know that there are people who here this morning might even be questioning, how can I have joy? And even though they're in Christ, they're struggling, I pray that you would help them this morning. Give them an extra measure of grace today. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for helping us to understand this morning. And I thank you that you will never leave us, never forsake us. And I thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.